All horror games use science to scare us, but what are they doing, and why? While all horror games are influenced by other media, the processes they use to scare us have to be more nuanced. When we play games, we're driving the experience, rather than passively consuming. Sometimes, this makes it easier to frighten us. We have to do the terrifying thing, such as opening a door or exploring a dark area, rather than watching someone else. But it also makes things more complicated. We can go anywhere and do anything, so designers have to use other methods to keep us on edge. So how do games do it? With science. In this video, we're going to look at some of the tricks that are used to keep us on our toes. From subconscious audio cues to psychological priming. And we'll discover that rather than relying on simple jump scares, games like Amnesia, Alien Isolation and Dead Space use complex, inventive systems to help keep us horrified for extended periods. Prepare your cushions, people. Here are seven ways games use science to scare us. Sound design is the most important aspect of horror game design full stop. In 2012, the University of Abate monitored 12 students playing Amnesia The Dark Descent. When the audio was switched on, heart and respiration rates increased by up to 20 beats per minute. But more than this, in an environment where the player has agency over most of the things that happen, sound is the one constant that developers can use to frighten us. Silent Hill is a useful example. As well as using more obvious audio cues like the dreaded siren and your crackling radio, it uses ambient noise to help keep you on edge. Composer Akira Yamioka deliberately chose sounds that people subconsciously hate. There's the sound of a pitch-shifted dentist's drill in the final boss fight, for instance, and the school section uses the sound of chalk scratching down a chalkboard. And Silent Hill, like many horror games, uses non-linear sound to great effect. This is when the audio exceeds the standard musical range of an instrument, or the vocal cords of an animal. This puts us on edge because normally we hear non-linear sounds in animal distress calls. It's like we're biologically preconditioned to fear them, and titles such as Amnesia, Resident Evil and Fear all use this. Games owe a debt to films like Psycho for the establishment of non-linear sound design, but there are titles out there that deliberately try to avoid the tropes established in the movies. For example, composer Jason Graves was instructed to avoid melodies and themes when designing the sound for Dead Space. Instead, he uses urgent atonal soundscapes by playing random notes as quickly as possible. It's not melodic, but it is effective. And if you're really feeling brave, the link to his site is in the description below. Dead Space's sound design was a big influence on Alien Isolation audio director Jeff Van Dyke. The stealth aspect of the game makes sound even more important. It's as much about the noise you make as it is the things you hear, and even the motion tracker works like an audio version of detective vision, forcing you to listen for threats as well as look for them. And finally, here's some really bad news. A study by Nottingham Trent University found that gamers will sometimes keep hearing sounds from games long after they finish playing. The university calls this game transfer phenomena and hopefully explains why you can still hear the radio crackling long after you've turned off your PC. What noise? Have you ever wondered why so many horror games have puzzles? It's all to do with anxiety. This is a concept distinct from fear, which is a response to a current threat. Anxiety is about building anticipation towards a future threat. It's one of the most effective tools a game can use, and solving puzzles actually heightens your anxiety. In an excellent Gama Sutra article on this, neuroscientist Dr. Moral Tajerian explains that when perceptual systems are tested, the threat of some imminent danger can increase your sensitivity to potential future dangers. In other words, solving puzzles might make you even more anxious. While the act of solving the puzzle itself might not be frightening, think about what happens next. In Resident Evil 7, for example, you know that you'll have to explore a new area and potentially face a new conflict. But it goes deeper than that. The article goes on to explain that unlike first-person shooters which tend to desensitise us to violence, solving puzzles might actually make us more receptive to danger. It's the same adaptive behaviour shown in animals, designed to keep us alive in dangerous environments. By keeping us anxious and engaged, games keep us alive to the dangers around us. Now, how about a Professor Layton Layers of Fear crossover? 
This is an interesting one, because video games, unlike other traditional media, are about giving us agency. But in the same breath, taking it away can be enormously powerful. This isn't just about rethinking how combat works in games, although there is an excellent blog on the Frictional website about just that. Instead, it's about limiting your freedom in evocative ways. Early horror games such as Silent Hill and Resident Evil did this with rigid camera angles. And games like Amnesia and Alien Isolation limit your personal freedom by forcing you to hide or to be cautious of the noise you make. The same blog on the Frictional website argues that the feeling is less effective when control is taken away from the player during a cutscene or QTE, however. The feeling is just different because suddenly you're watching an event rather than actively participating in it. This is probably why really tactile elements are so important. It's a reminder that you're still in the driving seat. This feeling of having control and the subsequent loss of it is the reason we're scared of things like the dentist in real life. And in turn, that's the reason there's a secret dentist's drill noise in Silent Hill. Clever. Horror games also use something called priming. Priming is a psychological term which measures how your response to a stimulus is influenced by the exposure to a previous stimulus. This basically means that if you've been subconsciously influenced by something before, your future responses will change. It's a trick used in mind reading and mentalism to plant ideas in people's heads. Games do this via foreshadowing. Silent Hill 2, for example, shows you two horrible cutscenes before you fight Pyramid Head. You know what he's capable of, and that makes your first encounter all the more horrifying. This is also the reason that horror games have areas that encourage us to lower our guard. Once you know an area is safe, you relax, allowing developers to deliver a bigger scare later on. A great example of this is the corridor in Resident Evil 2. The first time you see those boarded up windows, you expect something to happen. When it doesn't, you let your guard down, making the jump that follows later on even more effective. Let's go slightly deeper. In the same Gama Sutra article, Dr. Trajarian goes on to explain mirror neurons. These are the regions of the brain that are active when an animal performs an action or observes another individual performing that same action. The second bit is important. The suggestion is they're crucial to helping us understand the intentions and actions of other people and imitating what they do. And what does this have to do with games? Plenty. It's possible that mirror neurons actually help us empathize with our virtual avatars on screen. Because of mirror neurons, you inadvertently experience the same thing as the character you're playing. When James sticks his hand in the toilet, for example, mirror neurons are the reason you feel disgusted too. And even though many horror games take place in unrelatable locations, such as a 19th century castle in Amnesia, mirror neurons could be the reason you can't help but put yourself in the protagonist's shoes. This, of course, makes the whole experience far more terrifying. You're not just controlling a virtual avatar, you're empathising with the very threat they're experiencing. Do you play horror games with the lights off? If you want to be scared, you should. The environment in and out of game is hugely important, and there's a biological reason for this too. Dr. Tajerian describes how we evolved to be this way. Humans are diurnal, meaning we're active during the day and vulnerable at night. A horror game for a nocturnal animal, in contrast, would take place on a sunny afternoon. Everybody's gone to the rapture is vermin type for rats. The right setting can use our own neurobiology to frighten us. When you play a properly dark game in the right environment, preferably with an excellent set of headphones, you'll have a much richer experience because of the way you're biologically wired. So if we're hardwired to avoid this stuff, why do we do it? Because realistically, we're still in control. Dr. Andrew Weaver, an assistant professor at Indiana University, suggests that we watch horror movies to conquer our fears. The after effects of being legitimately scared are actually quite damaging, and it's only because we know these things aren't real that we allow ourselves to be scared. And that's the central challenge to making an effective horror game. Which leads me to my final point, learning. Strictly speaking, this is biology working against developers, and it's a problem all horror games have. Scaring players in an interactive environment is hard. Most games become more effective with repetition. You become better at hitting a combo or nailing a headshot. But horror games become less effective the more chance you get to practice. 
the first time you experience a scare in the game will probably be the only time it really works. Once you've learned a game's systems, those animal instincts kick in, making you more wary of blind corners and rattling vents. You start taking control of the game, rather than being the victim, and suddenly, it's no longer frightening. This then is the challenge that horror games face. As neuroscience advances, it will uncover new ways to frighten players, and the developers of Amnesia suggest a raft of different ideas, causing fear through emotions such as personal reflection. Another suggestion on the Frictional blog is implication, that sense of gnawing fear that permeates our lives even after we've logged out. That would undoubtedly take us to the next level of horror, but is it something we really want? Links to all our sources are in the description below. Please do check them out for a more detailed examination of the stuff we've talked about today. And if you enjoyed this, please give us a like and subscribe to Logitech G for more weekly videos.